You're listening to The Social Workers on WCDB Albany. And welcome back to The Social Workers here on WCDB Albany. The Social Workers is a live radio talk show that's hosted every Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock here on WCDB Albany. My name is Eric Hardeman. and I'm your co-host with Alyssa Lotmore. Welcome back, Alyssa. Hi, Eric, and happy first day of Social Work Month. Ah, that's right. Thank you. So March is Social Work Month, National Social Work Month. We've got some exciting events coming up at the School of Social Welfare related to Social Work Month, and we also have a very special special show for you today. Here on the telephone, actually, let's start this way. Here in the studio, we have a special guest interviewer with us, Dr. Lonnie Jones from the School of Social Welfare. Welcome, Dr. Jones. Thank you, Dr. Hardiman and Alyssa. <laughs> uh, excited to be here as we celebrate Social Work um, Excellence Month as well as celebrating Women's History Month. Absolutely. So we'll be on a first name basis for this show. So, uh, so Alyssa, Lonnie, and I are going to interview a very special guest on the telephone. And and we'll bring her in in just a minute, but I'd like to say that we will be interviewing Dr. Salome Rahim. She is one of the pioneering contributors to the social work profession. Dr. Rahim is former director of the University of Iowa's School of Social Work and former dean and current professor at the University of Connecticut School of Social Work, where she was the first African American to be appointed as dean. Her passion for creating more just organizations and communities has taken her across the United States and to four continents to provide training and consultation to schools, universities, human service organizations, and businesses. She's held many national leadership positions, and we're very, very honored to have Dr. Rahim on the telephone today. Uh, welcome, Dr. Rahim. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you so much for the welcome, and good morning. Thank you. Good morning to you. Well, um, let, let me begin. Um, hi, Salome. This is Lonnie Jones. And ex as I stated, excited to um, have this opportunity to engage with you. And I, let me first um, let everyone know that on March 9th from 1 to 4, 430 we will be hosting Salome um, in our continuing education program building our capacity to practice in the context of difference and disparity we ask if you're interested in attending especially University at Albany students and faculty as well as staff please go to the University at Albany School Social Welfare website um, Dr. Salome just to begin um, if we could uh, talk a bit about um, when you talk about b building capacity to practice and thinking about difference in the context of disparity, um, how do you see that? Well, the way I see that is it's critical for us to work effectively to understand the context of our, our work, what we bring to it and those that we are engaged with. So by that I mean taking uh, culture into account, uh, and I am defining that in a very broad way, so working effectively in the context of a wide range of human differences, and also taking other contextual factors into account, and that includes historical oppression, current disparities that exist in our society that may uh, impact those we serve, uh, that may diminish the opportunities they have uh, access to and impact their quality of life, as well as uh, salient uh, contemporary issues. And I would mention one more uh, important contextual issue that pervades all of our work, and that's uh, power and privilege dynamics. These are critical to understand if our work is to be effective. Now, when we're talking about the, the work of social workers, a lot some of our audience, uh, we have social workers who listen to our show, but there's a lot of people from the general public who just tune into our show um, when it's airing. So can you just sort of give a basis of, you know, the term, you know, co what you mean by cultural competence? I mean, your upcoming workshop, you're going to be incorporating that, and we're, as we're talking about practice, what does it really mean to be culturally competent? 
Okay, uh, as I m- m- spoke a bit about being culturally competent, it's this ongoing process, we never really get there, but it's increasing our ability to work with, uh, work in the context of a wide range of human differences. So social workers work with uh, people who may differ from them along um, many dimensions of social identity race and ethnicity, age, uh, disability factors, sexual orientation, mm, and gender identity. And all of these kinds of differences within the social relationships that, that we're engaged in, they have an impact on practice. They are uh, important to consider in practice and and working effectively means understanding how the differences between us should be taken into account and how uh, those various social identities may have had an impact or not may have have had an impact on uh, people's lives and uh, being able to incorporate that into the, the process of engaging people and working with them to accomplish in their lives what they want to accomplish. No, it's, it's such a deep topic. I mean, we must only touch the, the top tip of the iceberg with a lot when we're talking about cultural competence because you just mentioned so many different things that how, how we are practicing, how cultural competence plays a role in it. Um, but there's so many different things to think of. So I'm really excited to have you here and, and talk a little bit um, just about the practice skills that we can have as social workers to really reach um, the individuals we're working with. And you've had a long history of working in these areas. You know, I I wonder, Salome, over the years, you've, you've, I would assume, have heard the the phrase cultural competence change over the years. And certainly it's something we've been talking about in the social work profession, but maybe not something that's been in the general discourse within society as much, sort of, you know, thinking about what a more culturally competent society where people interact with each other differently in the community. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit, and this may be a tough question, but sort of how the, the notions of cultural competence have changed over the years. That's an important question. And this gives me the opportunity to tell you something that I, I hear very, very little spoken about. When the term cultural competence was originally conceived by uh, Terry Cross, uh, who's the, the former executive director of the Native uh, uh, NICWA, mm. the National Indian Child Welfare Association. Um, the term rose up out of a process in which a group of people, who people of color, who were at a SAMHSA meeting, I'm sorry, that's the, um, the federal organization, um, that 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 uh, manages programs related to um, children and children's welfare. A group of people of color got up and walked out of a meeting hmm. because the culture, cultural differences, cultural histories, including the history of oppression, was not being taken into. Uh, account and the federal policies that were in place were really damaging to children and families of of color. And so what ensued from that was the seminal work that Terry Cross and his colleagues did about uh, developing culturally competent systems of care. Mm. Now, over time, so you can, can see from its inception that cultural competence and getting those words and those concepts on the table and in public discourse, at least in federal agencies, and it is a part of the discourse now in in, um, DHHS, that was a game changer. Now, unfortunately, what has happened over time is that cultural competence 
can be misunderstood and misapplied in ways that make it very superficial and really take take the power out of it. So while it's very important to understand the cultural norms, the cultural beliefs of those that we work with, what holidays they celebrate, what foods they eat, those things are not trivial, but that's the start. That's not the end game. Cultural competence needs to be about social justice. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I'm doing in this presentation and in my work is bringing together cultural competence and social justice as it was originally intended. And that's why I'm using the term culturally competent social justice practice because the fundamental aim of social work must be advancing social justice. And when cultural competence is not connected conceptually to social justice by those who are, are practicing, it becomes um, uh, it, it becomes a much more lightweight concept than it was intended to be. So over the years, what I've seen is this very, I'll call it revolutionary stance mm -hmm. that uh, began to, to change things. Um, and then cultural competence moving into this area of being just more about culture and cultural differences and how we can say, the, say things appropriately and act in some appropriate ways so that we have better relationships with our clients and maybe show them a little more respect. Um, cultural competence has been roundly criticized uh, for uh, this as well, but I contend that it's uh, those who are applying the, the uh, this, uh, those who are applying cultural competence in ways that it's not intended to, I want to see a refocus on cultural competence with a very strong social justice uh, component. So those are some of the changes that I've seen over time. Great. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, and as we begin to think about cultural competence, and I'm sure you're you're aware of what's happening across the nation on college campuses in regards to whether it's um, incidents of sexual assault or, base, or incidents based on race or gender. And I'm just wondering, um, as we look to f move forward on our campus, can you share with us a bit as, um, you know, because I, I, I'm not sure if... Um, so this becomes the struggle here when we begin to talk about cultural competence and instead of kind of being specific um, and pointing out those areas that are um, heavy, um, pointing out issues of gender, pointing out issues of race. Can you speak a bit to... Um, in particular on college campuses, how we began to think from a social justice standpoint why being culturally competent or working towards culturally competence, but there's these impediments around getting to the, the gut of the issue that's really taking place. I appreciate your question very much, and I, I think this is at the core of, of what we need to focus on so that cultural competence can be used in in, um, in, a, in appropriate ways in the service of, of social justice. So I see cultural competence as a starting point. I see it as a framework that I've found very uh, useful in helping people to see the whole landscape of what may need to be done on an individual or organizational level. And within this broader framework of cultural competence, we absolutely need to be talking about the specifics. So the cultural competence doesn't happen in the abstract. It happens specifically in the context of uh, working out issues of race and racism and gender and sexism and sexual orientation and 
homophobia. So, um, cultural competence gives us some um, ways of and some guidance mm. about how we need to prepare ourselves to deal with these very difficult issues. For example, uh, cultural competence guides us to look at our own, to take culture into account, to look at our own cultural uh, beliefs, our, our own values, our own implicit biases. And I see the cultural competence work that we can do as preparatory to engage in these really difficult uh, issues of race, racism, um, sexism, and without doing the work that we need to do both um, in, in preparation, then we can come to these conversations uh, that must be had, um, and let's talk about racism since that's a key thing that's going on, I know, on your campus. We come to these dialogues unprepared. We come not having considered what, um, how our own cultural upbringing has caused us to be uh, privileged in some ways, blind to uh, issues in some ways. And so if we don't do the cultural competence work by whatever name we want to call it, then it's not possible for us to engage in productive ways uh, to understand the, uh, to understand the nature of the power and privilege that is uh, a part of the underlying issues for many of the isms that, that I've mentioned. So I see cultural competence as a framework, but also preparatory for um, dealing with specific issues. And it seems like there's a lot, you know, on the part of like maybe the social worker, there seems to be a, a real, a certain aspect of self-assessment, self-reflection that needs to go into this. But it's more, you know, from my, under what you're, from my understanding of what you're saying, you know, we can read about what is culturally competent and, you know, certain practices and read about histories. But if we don't take that time to self-evaluate and self-reflect and have the understanding of our own biases and our own, our own culture, that's sort of a critical, it seems to be sort of a critical aspect aspect of developing uh, being a culturally competent social worker or individual? Absolutely. The past 30 years of neuroscience research has shown us that unconscious bias plays a tremendous role in, in our behavior. And unfortunately, a lot of the um, dominant systems that are in place, our educational system, for example, the way history is told, our media, the images that are portrayed, many of those systems play into the perpetuation of unconscious biases. So unless, and those unconscious biases have an effect on how we assess others, which is, you know, key in social work, who we trust, who we don't trust, who we hire, who we think shouldn't be hired. And so ongoing self-assessment and reflection and then taking action once we identify those biases so that we can change them is, uh, just as you say, it is fundamental to uh, effective practice in general and it is certainly critical to engage the very thorny issues that uh, we're dealing with nationally. And, um, and about you mentioned race and racism. And you mentioned the media and how the media does play a role. So, I mean, as social workers, as we're developing these skills, we're we're doing a lot of the self reflection and self, um, you know, really taking that time to process what's going on. But how do we raise awareness and advocate for more cultural competence in our society? I mean, it's one thing when we think about social workers in the you know in the classroom with our students as practitioners in our, you know in our community. But how do we spread that? How do 
do we get that message of what we're learning and how we do need to be reflective and we do need to, you know, be able to understand cultural competence? How do we advocate to have that more widespread so that things like the mainstream media don't really give us these images and and things that are causing biases amongst the general population? We have we we have tremendous opportunities to contribute to change. Social workers are embedded in so many agencies and organizations uh, that do micro level work, that do macro level work. We have access to a wide range of people through our work and. If in the context of our, our work, uh, not, not with the individuals that we serve, but also with our colleagues, our coworkers, and our organizations, if we use our influence to raise issues of power and privilege and help others understand those dynamics, if we take the opportunities and create opportunities to raise issues that are related to uh, how unconscious biases, for example, are affecting uh, the work that is being done. If we take the opportunities to, uh, say, for example, we're working in a school. (coughs) If we take the opportunities to help the students that we're working with, as well as teachers and the administration, understand the process of unconscious bias, how it works, how it's influencing the decisions that are being made about who gets suspended and who's at fault when there's a a fight, or even in the evaluation of students' work. If we take our understandings of these things into our workplace, we We're everywhere, and we have such an incredible opportunity to make um, change in all of those areas where we have the ability to have uh, influence. So that's, that's, that's a partial answer, but that's, um, that's still, there's, there's just so much, we're so ideally placed. Yeah. to impact so many uh, different sectors of, of society that if we use that influence with social justice as our mission, we can have a tremendous impact. No, thank you. That's a really a great explanation because as social workers, sometimes, you know, even with students, we're in a class usually with a lot of individuals who have that same sort of understanding or, you know, they're building on cultural competence. And then you go out into practice and you realize, hey, everyone doesn't see things the same way or everyone doesn't, you know, have that same background as as I do, you know, as when I was sitting in the classroom with other people who are learning the same things. So it's really good as social workers to know, okay, when we get into, you know, the real world, you know, quote unquote, how do we then be able to share our knowledge in a way that it can impact society? How can, how can it impact the community and help them to become more aware of those um, those biases that they may not realize that they have? Absolutely. I, I want to give you two specific uh, examples of what I was just saying. What, and somehow I'm on school social work, so I'm going to stay there. <laughs> That's perfectly think fine. About, think about how powerful it would be if social workers working in schools created opportunities for students to uh, do two things. Uh, uh, Understand unconscious biases and how they're operating in their lives and create opportunities to challenge those biases in their daily lives, both at school or at home. The neuroscience, as I said earlier, uh, supports this, so it's ha- what it is and how how implicit bias works, which is another way of saying unconscious bias, how it works and how it can be undone. The science proves that, so, you know, there, those, there are programs that could be, be created for that. And not only the students, but the teachers as, as well, that would have a tremendous impact, I believe, on 
suspension suspension rates and expulsion rates and yeah. uh, and students um, students students performance. If the okay, I'll leave it there with students performance. <laughs> but think about one more kind of thing. What if social workers, in collaboration with teachers, created opportunities for students to uh, view and critique the media that they're engaged with from a critical lens. How powerful would that be if if students learned, if young people learned to look at those images that they are immersed with, bombarded by, through a critical lens? It would change everything. I mean, I think that could be a great assignment even for college students too. really. I mean, you know, to really take that time to look at what the media is giving us and how do we break that down. So just to remind you, if if you're just tuning in, you're listening to WCDB Albany. This is the Social Workers Live Radio Talk Show. And we have with us by telephone special guest, Dr. Salome Rahim from the University of Connecticut. She's a pioneering social worker and social work educator and will continue the conversation. Uh, She's talking about cultural competence, social and economic justice, diversity, and many other related topics. Dr. Jones? Yes. Um, Salome, if, if we, I would just love to expand as we begin to come to a close here in talking about your work um, in terms of your integration of mon- mind-body-spirit approaches into health and healing, because I find that fascinating, and, and perhaps that is a way for social workers to begin to shift their understanding of culture and everything that's embedded and to finding um, ways of wellness to work with for themselves as well as for those that they serve yes I'm I am glad that you asked and I see my work in integrated mind body spirit social work as very much connected and supportive of Um, the work that I do around cultural competence and social justice. And you touched on the multiple ways that this mind-body-spirit work is relevant. First of all, the work that social workers do in general is taxing, and we need resilience so that uh, we need practices that support our resilience. And once we begin to talk about doing the self-reflection and uncovering unconscious biases and working those out to stick with it, we need even more resilience. And so any mind, body, spirit ways of addressing our self-care supports us in our resilience and, and our sticking to what is important to us. But interestingly, um, this mind-body-spirit approach to practice even supports our uh, addressing unconscious biases. And this this is not the only way, but this is a very specific example. So one of the ways of interrupting unconscious bias is through Uh, being present, attentive, and mindful of uh, how we're engaging, how we're interacting, um, and being deliberate and and intentional and paying attention. So mindfulness practice, which is the mind-body-spirit practice, is a, a way of improving our practice with others, so not only for our own self-care, but to make us practice better so that rather than thinking about the millions of things that are pressing upon us in real time, when a person is before us that we are working with and may be tempted to make some quick judgments about, we have tools for being truly present and in the moment so that we can engage that person as they are and not how all the biases that we may have going on may make us think they are. That's just, that's just one example yeah. of how integrative mind-body-spirit work supports 
our practice in general and our cultural competence and social justice work specifically. Thank you, and I, I, I truly, and I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation with students, faculty, and staff of uh, the Albany community as you come to present on Beyond Commitment, Building Our Capacity to Practice in the Context of Difference and Disparity on Wednesday, March 9th at the University of Unitarian Universalist Society Church at 405 Washington Avenue in Albany. Um, we so appreciate you and everything that you offer to the pro profession across the country. Um, and I, 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 um, everything that you have given today, I look forward to beginning to refresh uh, my commitment to social work, to social justice. Yeah, I, w I would I would agree, Salome. You've really been pulling together a lot of uh, fascinating threads for us, and certainly things we've been thinking about at the School of Social Welfare here at the University of Albany, but also things that faculty and students have been talking about uh, individually and in smaller groups. And I think a lot of the the threads are starting to come together, but it's it's a difficult process, and we're looking forward to having you help us with that process. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate this opportunity to talk with all of you this morning. I very much appreciated your, your questions and reflections, and I'm very eager to be there next week so that we can continue this conversation. And, and maybe, Alyssa, if you could tell listeners a little bit about where they can find uh, information about our show. And also, uh, Salome, I'll invite you, too, if you have, um, you know, a website or something that you'd like listeners to check out if they're interested. That's, that's something we can also announce over the air. Well, for, um, for today's show, it will be available um, online. As always, we put our shows on YouTube, and you can always look at our website, our Facebook page, and our Twitter feed um, to find past episodes of the show. And like I said, for the conference, if you are interested, or this workshop, upcoming workshop, if you are interested in registering, just go to the University at Albany uh, School of Social Welfare website, and there is a link for continuing education, and you can find the registration link there. And I would invite listeners to check out the Privilege Project, hmm. an invitation to uh, narrative practitioners to address issues of privilege, power, and, and dominance. I, I think if they just Google my last name, Rahim, and the Privilege Project, they, they will have to remember everything I just said. <laughs> Great. So you've been listening to The Social Workers, and we've been interviewing Dr. Salome, Salome Rahim. And uh, Salome, we'd like to thank you so much for being our guest this morning. We hope you'll come back uh, to the radio show, uh, you know, down the road after you've been to Albany and we've gotten to meet you. Maybe, you know, in the future we'll have you back on the radio again. It would be my pleasure, and thank you for having me. Thanks for listening.